Test one, two, three, four, five. Rod, can you hear us? Heard you there for a second, but sound kind of faded out for a second. Yeah, I hit the button too many times. You're loud and clear here. Gotcha. All right, everybody, good evening. Um, we're gonna get started. It's 7.29 according to the uh, computer clock. I got 7.32. I'm not sure which one's right, but we'll go with uh, an average and say it's 7.30. So if everybody will stand, we'll say the pledge. Michael brings up the flag. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation, uh, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. It's warm in here. All right. So first and foremost, let me just sit there and say, uh, sorry for the smaller room tonight. Uh, our apologies for air conditioners doesn't seem to want to work in here tonight. And this is not the time of year for Floridians not to have AC. So uh, we're going to try to uh, just kind of rapidly go through our normal part so we can get to the presentation and uh, hopefully wrap it up a little earlier so that way we can enjoy some maybe cooler air outside in Florida. Imagine that in, July, in June. Um, the uh, mix up happened somehow back in January, uh, Fairgrounds said they let us know that uh, 
they had to bump us back a week because there's other production going on here this weekend. Um, our contract says it was tonight. Uh, so they accommodated us by giving us this room and stuff like that. Um, if they told us, Michael and I don't remember anything about it. She says she told both of us, but that was right before Hamcation. So we, our focus could have been right on Hamcation at the time, not worrying about a June meeting and stuff. So I don't want to say she didn't tell us, but we just don't remember it. So um, let me go around the room real quick. Um, of course, for those of you guys who are new or haven't been here before your first meeting, my name is John Ott. I'm, my call sign is N4JTK. I'm the club president. Michael Cauley, vice president and Hamcation general chairman. His call sign is W4ORL. Um, Ed Thralls is right here. Uh, N4, 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 E. N E 4 H. I always get yours mixed up for some reason. One of our uh, club directors, Bob Cummings, is on the table in the back. Um, he is one of our directors. Uh, or W two B Z Y is his call sign. I'm trying to scan through the room real quick. Any other directors I'm missing? Bob is the secretary. W four K B W up front. James N zero X I A is one of our directors also. Our uh, treasurer is not making it here tonight, um, or one of the other directors. Um, work commitments got in the way. Um, I'm not sure about the other couple of directors, but uh, a lot of the guys kind of work late this week. So, and Frank, uh, Frank G's out of town, isn't he? Yeah. Oh no, I'm sorry, Frank. Uh, Frank T. Frank T. Yeah, that's right. I forgot he's back up in New York right now. All right, Bob. Test session. Okay, well, I'm going to bring a microphone to you so everybody on Zoom can hear you. Plus, it's recorded. Well, Bob's looking up that information. Um, is there any new members here tonight? Have, stand up real quick and just say your name, call sign. Hi, everybody. Jamie Eubank, Kilo Echo 8, Victor, November Victor. Uh, I live in Auburn Hills and moving to Williamsburg. Ooh, moving in closer. Welcome. Glad to have you. Any other new members? Oh. I'm not really a member yet. I'm just newbie, don't have a call sign, just trying to find out the whole skinny on where to even start. We can help with that. That's not a problem at all. We'll definitely get you, give you all the information you need. Anybody else? Let me come back to you. Make it easy. My name is Chris. I'm just learning how to uh, want to learn how to get into it. Okay. Excellent. Welcome, guys. All right, Bob, you about there? Or you want me to come back to you? Aaron should print it out for you. You had your his thing. Okay, out of the six people we have tonight, everybody got something except one person. Uh, we did have, let's see, one, two, three upgrades to general, and we picked up um, one new technician. Congratulations to everybody. All right, let me... Um... Let's talk a little bit about field day real quick. Um, field day is coming up June 24th and 25th, um, about two weeks, a little over two weeks away. Um, sent out a bunch of emails about it, sent out emails in reference to signing up, um, one for operating positions, two for lunch on Saturday, and three for dinner on Saturday evening. Um, if you are planning on helping set up or tear down uh, you're more than welcome to join us for lunch or dinner on Saturday. If you are planning on operating, obviously, you're more than welcome to join us for lunch or dinner on Saturday or both. Um, we will have plenty of, of um, water and sodas and stuff available for everybody to make sure they stay hydrated over the weekend. Um, June, for those of you who shouldn't already know this, but just in case you have to be reminded, uh, hydrate. I would even suggest hydrating a lot before field day weekend because it's going to pull it out of you really quick on Saturday and Sunday, uh, especially in Florida. Um, that's, we've been lucky so far. We've been in the 80s quite a bit. Um, 
And also, um, next week, we're supposed to hit 97 as the high is going already. So it's going to be going up, as you know. Email that we did send out um, is a link for sign up genius. This is the uh, for signing up all the different um, positions. The first one, do you want to click that real quick, Michael? Yep, I'll come back real quick to that in just a second. Um, if you scroll that down or up a little bit, um, you'll notice all the different positions from Saturday, 20 meter station, 20 or 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Each position or each station in each time slot has two positions, one for one person to um, log, another person to operate the radio. Our suggestion is after an hour, switch positions. OK, so everybody has a chance to be on the radio or log. Of course, the operators at the time, you guys discuss if you want to do that or not, but that's our suggestion. Then there's a 40 meter station. Uh, keep scrolling. A CW station and a satellite station. All right. Um, we are actually going to be a four alpha station with Lamars and Simmel County areas and Orange County areas. The satellite station does not count, but we do have a second CW station that's going to be run by a couple of blind individuals all the blind guys, CW station, okay? And they kind of take man their own station through for the 24 hours. And I'm, they might ask for help. Who knows? I don't think they ever did last year. They, they pretty much operate the full 24 hours themselves. But we'll be a four alpha station, okay? So we have a 20 meter, 40 meter, a CW station, a secondary CW station, and then a satellite station. Satellite station does not count with stations, but it does count on points. Okay, the contacts they make. Uh, and we'll have a go to station for what's called as a get on the air, which is a great one for public to come and get on the air for the first time for the, that weekend. New amateurs, technicians, um, but we also encourage you to go into the trailers that man the different stations and observe and join them. You know, ask them, hey, can I sit down for a few minutes and log? Can I sit down for a few minutes and make a couple of contacts? They'll let you do it. Just, you know, let them know that you're interested in doing stuff, and they'll be more than happy to. Um, some of the guys will probably pick up extra time slots that are not, have not been filled, and they'll take a, a break for a few minutes. You know, they'll sit there with you, make sure that you do it properly, and, and, and if you have any questions, answer those questions. But at the same time, it gives them a chance to take a break and relax for a few minutes, okay? And now we'll operate on Saturday, starts at 2 p.m., ends on Sunday at 2 p.m., unless, by Florida tradition, Mother Nature has a different plan for us, okay? Um, I don't think any one of us, or nor do we, anybody is expected to be out in, you know, a thunderstorm, taking down antennas or, or breaking down stations and stuff. If it looks like it's gonna get bad, the, the plug will be pulled early, and we'll get things packed up hopefully before the storms even hit, okay? So that way everybody stays safe. Um, but anyways, that is uh, how you sign up. Um, just click on it, whatever position's open, and you can sign up for it. The other two links are for Saturday. Um, the first one is for Saturday lunch. If you click on that, give it a second, it pulls up. Um, it says there are 75 slots available. Obviously, we will make that change if we need to. We can add more to it. It's just trying to give us an idea. And just click the sign up. You're going to put in your information, your, your first, last name, call sign, and email address. And we collect that information, one, for a head count. So we always want to make sure we have enough food for everybody. And the other point is, in case there's any sudden changes, last minute changes, we have an email address. We can, make, we can send you an email and stuff. Um, Saturday is hamburgers, hot dogs, and what we're starting to refer to as honest, famous grilled chicken, um, which we just had at the Hamcation picnic, and then we'll have it again at, um, at field day. Dinner is going to be a uh, pasta uh, bar with several different types of pasta and all the things that go with it and stuff. Um, and then, of course, salad and breadsticks all catered in through Olive Garden. So we'll have Olive Garden that night. Um, so please, if you plan on uh, being there, sign up for it. We just want more than anything as a head count. Make sure we obviously have enough food. The lunch and dinner, more importantly, 
we like for you to sign up by two weeks from today, I believe is the date that it's on the email or the date that we sat there and said. The operating positions, you know, we can, it's not so critical to cut that off because it's not like having to order food, go shopping or whatever. Um, we'll probably keep that one up and running a little longer for the weekend. But at some point, maybe on Friday night, I'll shut it down, make a printout for all the station captains so they kind of know who's supposed to be manning their stations throughout the 24 hour period. Okay. Field day weekend. It is a opportunity for amateur radio spotlight themselves to the general public or anybody that's interested in amateur radio. Typically, a lot of us operate from home. Okay. It's hard for the general public to know who we are when we operate from home. We take our operations remotely, go to a public park and advertise that they were going to be out there and invite the public out, the news media, and they can come out and see what amateur radio is all about and gets people interested in amateur radio. The great thing about field day weekend is that particular weekend, if you come out to a field day station anywhere in the United States that's going on that weekend, you don't have to have a license to operate. You can actually operate under the club license, okay? We'll have mentors there with you, all right? They will be able to help you with the logging part of it and the uh, making contacts on the radio, okay? Um, so don't be afraid. You know, we all start it somewhere. It's just like we all learned how to drive at one point. Some of us might be more better drivers than others, okay? But we all start it somewhere, okay? You have to learn, be able to start doing it. Um, so it's a great opportunity for you guys that are interested in information. Um, it's going to be at Central Winds Park in Winter Springs. Um, if you go, there's a website. Um, I think I have put it in the actual uh, I think I put it in the newsletter that went out. Um, but if you go to lamars.org, uh, there's a link off their website. Uh, everything is on their website this year. Uh, um, address, information about um, Field Day Plus on um, how to sign up. Is all, the links are all there, too. Uh, you don't have to sign up. You just come out to visit. Um, don't worry about that so much. But the, the signing up more as far as for the operating positions or more for like club members. To, so we know we have enough operators, but if you are wanting to do it, you can still do it, feel free to. But this is the uh, the webpage that it's all on. So again, it's Lamar's Orlando Amateur Radio Club, Simmel County Aries and Orange County Aries jointly doing this field day operation again this year. This is Central Winds Park. We're gonna be up here in this field on the north side of the park, on the extreme south side of Lake Jessup. My recommendation is don't get too close to the edge of the water. Um, last, I think, time they did a, a count, there was over 13,000 alligators in that lake, okay? So don't go too close to the edge of the water. Um, but anyways, it's a fun, it's a fun weekend. Um, you could probably sit there and say a lot of people consider it a, a contest because you do gain points by as many contacts you can make. Uh, some of us don't really call it a contest. It's an opportunity for us to get out, show the public what we do, make contacts as a bonus, okay? More importantly, for those of us that are in Aries, it's an opportunity to operate remotely, um, make sure our equipment works and we can make contacts in case we are needed in an actual emergency. So different ways of looking at it. Okay. Any questions about field day? Sorry, was it hand? Okay. All right. We're moving along to Saturday in the park. Joe, you want to come up with that one? Last month, I put out a request asking if anybody in the club was interested in um, heading off something that we used to do in this club many, many years ago. Kind of got away from it. I'm trying to bring it back basically like a Saturday morning in the park. Um, not the best time of year to start it, but you know, we got to start it sometime. Um, so Joe volunteered to do it. And we're again, going to do a joint operation between Lamar's and OERC and Joe has more info. Hey there, my name's Joe KQ4 AID. And uh, like John said, ham's in the park. We're going to start in July, 
since we're doing field day in June, we're going to skip June. And if you're a new operator, you know, bring what equipment you have. If you don't have any equipment, come out there anyway. And uh, we're just going to practice, share, operate, you know, whatever it is we need to achieve out there to have a good time. Uh, I'm going to start about eight o'clock in the morning, be over, you know, noon, one-ish, two-ish, somewhere in that range, early enough to uh, beat all the heat and the rain. And uh, it's in the newsletter. If you got any questions, uh, you can contact me directly. Um, but you can also sign up just to let us know your interest. And that's going to help us gauge uh, the location that we ultimately do go to for uh, this first event. Excellent. Appreciate you volunteering, by the way. Um, if you go to our website, oerc.org, uh, there's a, a couple um, tabs at the top. One of them is called Club Tech. If you click Club Tech, a little drop down menu comes down, and all the newsletters, you'll see newsletters there. All the newsletters are there, currenting the, the current one and going back about four years, maybe five years. Um, Unfortunately, due to some previous uh, computer crashes and hardware drive failures and so on and so forth, other copies of them, late, later ones or, or earlier ones have uh, been lost, I guess, forever, unless we can find somebody that still has some. Um, but it goes back at least around 2016, um, 2017, or 2016, 2015 or so, as we have most of those up there, all right? So you can always go back and look at the, um, the newsletter. Um, or past editions of the newsletter um, in case you didn't get in for members didn't get in your email. It's always, as soon as I send it out to the club, I post it on the website next. Okay. And the, the latest one is always on top and then it drops down, you know, each month from that point. Any other questions on Saturday in the park? All right. Next one. In the newsletter that went out, I asked for individuals to collect uh, tabs, okay, um, can tabs or pull tabs or beer can tabs, nobody's judging here, um, soda cabs or whatever the case might be, um, soup cans have them, all right, if you would, if you would please do that, um, just say, throw them in a bag, you know, when you get some, bring them to the meeting, give them to my, uh, myself, or more importantly, give them to Christy, this is, uh, Excuse me, this is Christy. And are you have you started yet? The medical procedures? Okay. She's gonna have to go through some medical procedures and somehow we're not sure. I she knows. I know you know, but I don't quite understand it. But then again, we collect these back when I was in school for playground equipment. Okay. Somehow that is able to give her discounts off of some of those procedures that she has to have done. Okay. So um when was it you said at the picnic? Out of pocket? $1,200 for each procedure, each visit. $1,200 out of pocket for her. And this, I forget you said our quantity gives you so much of a discount. $300 off. Okay. So this helps Christy out tremendously. So please, if you don't mind, um, if you're an Aries member, you can bring the Aries meeting. If you're a... Um, Oh, we are seeing me, you know, next time you see me, hamcation, whatever the case might be. You're, and it's going to be several months worth of treatments and stuff you got to go through. So please, 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 please save them. Okay. Michael. I want to get away from the speaker there. Um, all right. Um, real quick. Quick, Hamcation, a uh, couple updates. One, we did go to uh, Hamvention. Uh, Hamcation did have a booth up there. Uh, we did good. Uh, talked to lots of people about Hamcation. Uh, went around, talked to a lot of vendors, a lot of new vendors there uh, that we've uh, got signed on now coming to Hamcation. Uh, several older vendors that hadn't been to Hamcation in many years are planning to come back next year. Uh, so it was a successful trip for us to be there this year. Um, so that was good. Um, we are starting to amp up our uh, committee meetings here soon for Hamcation uh, coming up in August. 
Uh, but I am in search of at least um, one chairman uh, to take over tailgate and then several uh, assistant chairs. If everybody got the newsletter, uh, it was in there. Uh, the biggest one right now is the tailgate chairman, um, which tailgate is all of our outside, um, basically swap area. People sell all their cars, so uh, you would be in charge of that area. There is already an assistant uh, chair for that area, but I do need a chairman to oversee the whole thing. Uh, so if anybody's interested, please see me about that. I can give you more information about it. Uh, plus, remember, by doing this, um, your hours goes toward a nonprofit of your choice. And this is a way to make that nonprofit more money throughout the year because we do give a donation at the end of the year uh, to these charities. Donations range from usually about $20 to several thousand dollars, depending on how many hours and how many people donate toward that charity. Uh, so um, it could be a ham club, it could be a nonprofit, anything like that we donate toward. Uh, so keep that in mind. That could be a way for your club to get extra money. That's it. Excellent. Appreciate it very much. Jim, have any questions on that so far? Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. Kenwood did make an appearance this year at uh, Hamvention, um, and they have already confirmed that they will be at Hamcation. Um, everybody probably might have heard of the news media release of a new, new radio from them, which was the replacement of the 74, uh, which is now the 75, the next model number up. Um, and uh, that is still in production, if I'm not mistaken. I think he sat there and said. It's not in production yet. So hopefully by hopefully by Hamcation, if everything goes as a plan, by Hamcation, that radio will be available. So uh, be a kind of a nice little bonus cap for uh, Hamcation to have a, the first radio out, or first Kenwood radio out in many years being presented. So, all right. Um, and there are some other vendors. Um, lists are going to be going up on the Hamcation's website here soon. Um, we've been contacted. I just got a phone call. In fact, tomorrow night after the Aries meeting, I have to go home at 10 o'clock tomorrow night. I have a Zoom meeting with two prospect or a prospective new company out of California. Hence, three-hour difference, I have to wait later so they, they're home and stuff to do it. So uh, it'll be an interesting thing. I think, I think we'll have another new, uh, new vendor. All right, I'm going to go around real quick, and I'm just going to mention um, to the board members first. Board members, did you have anything else you want to mention now? Anything? Okay. I'm just trying to save a little time so we can get, do our break get into the presentation and stuff. We open up the back doors here, try to get a little airflow through. Hopefully it helps cool it off a little more. Um, club updates. Anything on the club updates that have not has not been mentioned already in the past? Anything new and exciting? Joe? And I'm just trying to, everybody's probably heard about the nets and meetings and stuff like that there and stuff, but I just wanted to get anything new and important. You want a microphone? There you go. Don't be afraid of mics, we're hams. So uh, Lamar's is supporting the city of Winter Park for their 4th of July winter uh, celebration or winter, winter Springs. I keep saying Winter Park. Uh, winter Springs for the uh, Celebration of Freedom event. And we're looking for folks that come out and help us with it. We're going to be extra eyes and ears for the city. We're also going to be set up to share uh, ham radio with the general public. So uh, it's in the newsletter. If you uh, have an interest in helping out, please sign up. I know Angel did, and I appreciate that very much. Um, but just get a, uh, you can get the link in the newsletter, and we'll be sending a, a, another email out in a week or so. I will mention also in the newsletter is information if you can help with um, uh, Altamont Springs. Red Hot and Boom. Red Hot and Boom is on July the 3rd. Um, there is information in the newsletter on how to register or sign up for that. Um, so that's another worthwhile, worthwhile cause. Um, if you don't mind having about 200,000 people around you and lots of fireworks going off in the sky. 
Okay. So uh, please support these uh, as much as you can. All right. Any other clubs? Anybody have anything different that you want to announce real quick? Come on up. I just trying to again save time a little bit tonight too. Next up, go back. Hi, everybody. Kn KN4MDJ. As you know, I run radio scouting program. We've been working for the last month and a half to try and get a permanent location at Camp Onochi. Uh, they didn't go for us doing a $2 million STEM building because they didn't want to pay for it. But we did work out a deal where they're going to give us an entire campsite. We have campsite 4A now, which is a whole acre, including the activity building. And that's going to be a permanent location for radio scouting and also some other STEM activities. So we're working to get some about $200,000 in different grants and put a 200-foot tower up there. Camp is really looking forward to having reliable camp uh, radios in their uh, area because right now their current tower is 30 feet. <laughs> Appreciate it very much. And I know Ken's been working hard for many years now with the Boy Scouts getting this far. So any help that you guys can always give to them is always greatly appreciated. Um, anything else? Anybody else? Clubs, real quick, anything different you want to mount? So anything that's coming up between now and the next meeting? Okay. All right. Just moving along. Let's um let's take our break. All right. Um, I got eight o'clock. Let's say if we can be back here and say by eight, ten, eight fifteen at the latest. Um, and then we can uh get started with the presentation, our presentation tonight. And uh, Ed will come up in a minute and introduce Rhea. Uh, but Rhea is gonna do a uh, presentation on Beyond the Gas Generator Backup Power Strategy for Amateur Radio in the 21st Century. Guess where we live at, folks? Florida. Guess what we have visiting us this time of year? Hurricanes. Okay. Guess what we need? Backup power. All right. So it's going to be a good presentation, I'm sure. All right, guys, we'll come back in about 10 minutes. Bob's getting everything set up right now.
Try, folks. There's plenty of donuts still here. So uh, keep your doctor in business. Have a donut. All right, we've got about two minutes. We're going to get started again, guys. Two minutes. This is your two-minute warning.
All right, we're going to get started. We'll uh, get rolling here so that way we can uh, um, hopefully wrap it up fairly uh, quickly while it's still cool with the room. A um, couple things before uh, Ed comes up and, and introduce our presenter. Um, first and foremost, if you came in tonight and did not sign in on our log up front, please do so. Um, just put down your name, call sign if you have it. We always like to keep track of how many people we have at the meetings. Uh, secondly is um, we have um, three door prizes to give out tonight. Um, because I end up having to work Saturday, which I don't normally work Saturdays, but I had to work Saturday because they needed help. Um, I didn't get to HRO, so that's your benefit because we'll do three gift certificate gift certificates again for $25 a piece. All right. So um, make sure you've gotten a blue ticket. If you have not gotten a blue ticket, see uh, Rick. Rick will make sure you get one. Okay. So, uh, and then what we'll do is I'll go home tonight, purchase them online, send you an email with the information on your gift certificate. And then when you go to HRO, um, you present it to them, or if you order something offline, there's a, a number on it. We'll take $25 off. Um, do that tonight. And then lastly, uh, one thing I forgot to mention, Christy reminded me of this, and I appreciate it very much. Um, trying to get an agenda together, sometimes you forget things. Coming up June the 17th, Saturday, June the 17th, which is not this weekend, but next weekend, out at West Orange High School. I'm sorry? No, June 17th, which is uh, out of, on a Saturday, West Orange High School from 9 a.m. until 1 p.m., is the Orange County Hurricane Expo, okay? If you haven't been to the Hurricane Expo, it's a great opportunity to meet vendors on anything and everything reference to your safety during hurricanes, okay? Um, there's a lot of vendors there. There's a lot of giveaway things, um, drawings for different things. Plus, if you go around to all the different booths, a lot of time they have this little bingo card that the emergency management gives you. You visit all the tables, you get a stamp from each table, and at the end, you have a choice of a first aid kit or radio, weather radio, different things like that there they'll give to you, okay? Um, June 17th at uh, West Orange High School, okay? It's in the gymnasium. Um, Orange County areas will have a table there. I think some cert uh, volunteers will have tables out there. Um, you can always talk to us. Um, and then, of course, um, there's going to be a, usually around 50 vendors around in, in the, um, and even different departments from Orange County government, you know, uh, so you can get in contact with different people. So it's usually a great event. Lots of people come out to it. Um, so, you know, if you have time on the 17th, please take a few minutes and come out and visit with us. Ed, you ready? I'm sorry, guys, if I'm seeing like I'm moving around all day, I, I work 12 hour shifts and most of the day I'm sitting. So getting up, walking around for a few minutes, is like nice. Good evening. Uh, our guest speaker, Rhea Jaram, N2RJ, has been licensed since 1997 in Trinidad and Tobago and in the U.S. since 2001. She first became interested in amateur radio at the age of five with her, from her dad, an avid shortwave listener, and learned about amateur radio in high school and has been in the hobby ever since. Rhea is active in contesting, DXing, DMR, D-Star, and digital modes. She's an alumni of the uh, alumnus of the uh, New York uh, University Tandon School of Engineering, where she obtained her Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering. She does software engineering for the financial industry and renewable energy system design for EcoFlow Incorporated, a manufacturer of portable power systems and outdoor projects. Thank you very much, Rhea, for offering to uh, share your knowledge with us, and um, it's your show. Thank you. All right. Good evening. Thank you for the warm Florida welcome. Like, everything in Florida is warm. Hopefully, you guys don't have the wildfire smoke that we have here in um, New Jersey. Okay. Let me bring up the slideshow here, and um, we can begin. 
So yes, um, I am going to featuring, be featuring some EcoFlow products, but I'm also going to be talking about power systems in general. So it's not an ad for EcoFlow. It's more like a, you know, a discussion about how we can do things differently. All right. And um, not mentioned is also that um, um, I used to be a director of the ARL, but now I'm with another organization. So I'll talk about, you know, uh, myself too. So anyway, so this is Beyond the Gas Generator, Backup Power Strategies for Amateur Radio and Beyond. And I say beyond because, you know, sometimes when you're dealing with emergencies, a lot of hams, they have a lot of power for the radios. And in the house, yeah, you know, they have a little bit. But in Florida, you know better. My mom lives in Florida and she's um, she lives in Volusia County in, in Deltona. So she's been through a few hurricanes. I know all about it. I actually gave her a couple batteries systems and she has she's well prepared because our generator sat in the shed full of fuel and it got gummed up. So she's, you know, and of course, I'm not going to fly down there every few months to, to, to test and, and maintain the thing. So um, I'm there. I, I just, you know, gave her a couple of battery generators and then she's happy. She charges that up with solar panels and then she's good to go. So long story short. All right. <clears throat> so I was licensed in 97 in Trinidad. I was licensed in 2001 in Brooklyn, New York. And um, I'm alumna of the uh, New York University Tandon School of Engineering, which is an uh, um, engineering university in Brooklyn that used to be known as Polytechnic University. I do um, some consulting for energy storage. I do software engineering and in, in, in at, at the bank. Um, I'm a director of ARDC. I'm a past director of ARL and ARL Foundation. And I wouldn't go into the glory, de glory details, but ARDC, you know, come and said, um, they said, uh, uh, come with us if you want to live. No, they didn't say that. They said, come with us and make amateur radio much better. So I decided, you know what? That was an offer I couldn't refuse. I'm also at YLRL and I also do drones and photography and video creation. And I have a YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash at N2RJ. So why have I titled this presentation like this? Like I mentioned, my mom, I love my mom, but she's not mechanically inclined. And dare I say, you know, she might be a little, um, Maintaining the generator is not her top priority. For many people, a gas generator is all they need and it works well. So I'm not saying don't get one. I'm just saying there are other alternatives. But, you know, in 2023, we have new tech enabled by batteries and really big advancements in batteries. We have solar, you have wind, you have hydro, and you have alternative fuels. You know, some people might think these might cost a lot of money, especially if you've been quoted for solar lately. All the price of solar is going down. But, um, you know, there's a lot of whole set of things around solar. I design solar systems as well, too. So, um, but yeah, and then, of course, there's a the green part. So I care about being green. I understand everybody doesn't care about being green, and that's fine. That's your choice. But there's so much more than the green benefits, and by green I mean eco-friendly stuff. Um, <clears throat> there is green as in money, which is a, a good consideration as well. All right, so why do you want to look for an alternate energy source? So this could very well happen. Um, after a disaster, you might find that the gas station has lines that are two miles long, and... Um, they're running out of gas in new jersey after hurricane sandy we ended up having two hour lines for gas and the state decided to make things better by introducing rationing so what they did was they took the number the first digit of your license plate and then they assigned you a day so odd goes on one day even goes on the other day that worked real well and um, that was back in 2012 i believe it was and um it was um you know it worked real well and i'm i'm dripping with sarcasm here it was not it didn't go over well and a lot of people you know some people broke out in fist fights and all sorts of stuff so it's not it's not a good thing when you have scarcity after an emergency so often you want to be resilient 
right? And um, so that's the supply chain thing. Generators are noisy. Generators, you know, let me sing you the song of my people after midnight while your neighbors are sleeping. You don't want to do that. So you can have a generator and then you can have a quiet power source to keep your fridge running. Some fuels don't store well, right? Gasoline goes bad. You could treat it with fuel stabilizer. That's an option. But some fuels don't store well. Um, you can diversify your energy sources and you have resilience for that. And of course, even in, in non-emergency use, you could save money. But before you do, we always like to take a step back. What do you want to power with your stuff? Let's talk about your power needs of your radios, right? So each of your HF radio at 100 watts output. And I know there are people who run 100 watts on FT8. They're not supposed to, but some people do. Uh, you, you'll be burning 200 watts with that. Um, on SSB, that's going to be in, intermittent. And CW is going to be intermittent as well, too. A VHF radio, about 100 watts you're drawing with about 50 watts output. Um, an amplifier, because you need to be loud in an emergency, 2 kilowatts plus you're drawing. Um, computer, anyway, from anywhere from 25 watts to 500 watts and more. Um, you could run low power PCs or and Raspberry Pi, which is perfectly good. I did a video on my YouTube channel on the Evolve 3 Maestro. I did two videos on the Evolve 3 Maestro, which um, uh, they, like Micro Center had a, sold a bunch of them. And these are $60 laptops that are low power as well, too. Really good. But for your home, consider your centrals. You know, you have a well pump, you have a lights, a fridge. I have well water, so I have a well pump. You might have city water. Um, so, you know, that might not apply to you, but I have a well pump, so I need to power that. And the well pump might require 240 volts. And the power that draws, as I've measured, is anywhere from 500 watts to 2 kilowatts, because some people have deep wells. They have wells that go over 400 feet into the ground, and that requires more energy to pump. Um, so if you're running 240 volts, you might require a different setup. You might require two inverters um, and or a special one that does the 240 split phase. Uh, a refrigerator is an interesting case. A refrigerator draws power throughout the day, but it draws low amounts of power. And it draws low amounts of power except for when it defrosts. So when it defrosts, it'll kick off a heating element in the freezing compartment to basically defrost and that could pull like five six hundred watts easily so to measure your, your needs you can use an energy monitor and i have two types of energy monitor i talk about here All right so the first one on the left is a kilowatt essentially what you do is you plug in your device into that and then you plug that into the wall and you can actually measure the energy consumption of a single device and this will work, you know, could give to give you an idea generally of how much single devices consume. You could check it for your radios. You could see how much electricity you're using on a contest weekend. You could see how much you're using on field day uh, and so on. Or you could go whole home. So the one I chose for whole home is called Sense. And this is a, a view of Sense, but I'm going to actually show you my live Sense. And... Um, I'm actually going to uh, turn off my batteries, my home batteries, so that you get a full idea of what my whole home is drawing. And I'm going to do that right now. Um, here we go, off. Okay, so I just kicked on. And now let me stop this share and add another share here. Right, sense. Okay, there we go. So yeah, so I have this stuff here, right? And you can see here, you have different things that are detected by Sense. So how Sense works is that Sense actually doesn't um, go and um, um, hook into each device. With some energy monitors, they want you to attach devices to each circuit and measure it that way. Sense does some different. Sense actually kind of like listens for signatures of each device when it turns on and off. So generally when a device turns on, and I'll show you on the meter here, 
you can see here that there's like a little spike here and then an even bigger spike. So Sense kind of like categorizes these signatures and then it determines, well, you know, this type of device has a certain type of pattern. So might as well um, uh, determine it's this type of device. So yeah, so you're actually determining via signature when it turns on and turns off. And it actually d detects a fair good number of devices. So I have like my boiler pump in the winter um, because it's summer, we don't have any. Uh, let's see, let me see here for the year. You see usage, so I stopped using my heat in April and the boiler pump is not running in, in there. Um, you have the dishwasher. I use the dishwasher here. You can see, you know, how often I use the dishwasher. Um, my, my old electric vehicle, nope. And then I have the new one here, Tesla Model Y, which is my current electric vehicle. And you can see how much electricity I use for that. So it, it detects when it starts to charge and detects when it stops. So really cool. So this is a, a really good device to have. It's not that expensive. And um, it just hooks into your electrical panel. You might need an electrician to install it if you're not handy. It, it takes um, two breaker slots. So it essentially installs in a breaker and has two clamps that clamp onto the main wires in your panel. It has a Wi-Fi antenna. It connects to your Wi-Fi. Um, it does all sorts of other interesting stuff. Like it checks your power quality, you know, checks whether you have surges and um, also could detect like a loose neutral. So um, if you're um, from, not familiar with electrical stuff, the United States electrical system, you have two hot wires and you have a neutral. So essentially it's a center tap transformer that comes from um, the street. And if your neutral is loose, what's gonna happen is your voltage will vary a lot between the phases. And then some of your devices will get higher voltage than they're supposed to and get probably damaged. So you don't want to have a floating neutral. If you have a floating neutral, you need to call an electrician. And um, you might even need to call your power company if it's if it's at the street. So this is just some interesting things here. Other things that Sense does, um, you know, you can see here your usage and it's good for categorizing. You can export this data and do all sorts of stuff. And they have an app for Android and iOS too, right? So, all right. So let me go back to the slides. Okay. Radio. Right. So, yeah. So this was one I had here. All right. Um, so let's talk about options for, for saving on, on energy, right? Uh, some people could go QRP and portable. And they do, um, you know, it's the best bang for the buck. If it's if you have good antennas or you, you're a patient ham, it's good. If you're, if you're not a patient ham, then it's frustrating. It's not for everyone. I have um, I have my ICOM 705, and I've actually been building up my solar uh, setup for that. So I have some portable solar panels. I have a new um, MPPT controller that I'm testing, a new char solar charge controller that I'm testing. And I'm going to have some reviews of that on the YouTube channel soon. But some really interesting stuff. All right, so let's talk about your energy store sources and energy storage. So you can have um, <clears throat> different sorts of alternative energy um, sources. You can have solar, which is common, right? So you have plenty of sunshine there. You can use solar. Uh, wind power. So wind power is kind of something for people, you know, as an alternative energy source that might get cloudy and they don't have a lot of solar, so they go into wind. If you have running water nearby, like I have a stream on my property, you could use a micro hydro turbine. You can actually put like a hose in that in that stream and it'll go route to a, a micro hydro turbine and then that turbine will um, gen turn and generate electricity. Then you have gensets. Of course, um, most common ones are powered by gasoline, but these days a, a lot of people are experimenting with different types of alternative fuels like diesel or biofuel. And um, there is a, a farm near me that actually collects the waste vegetable oil and they make biodiesel to run in their tractors. And there are people who actually use those in gen sets as well, in generators. You can use also propane and natural gas. So uh, let's talk about natural gas first, because I think 
that should be really interesting if you have natural gas you know that that always runs and um, the compressor stations themselves are actually powered by the natural gas in the lines so they're always going to be running and um, so natural gas should pretty much always also always be there unless a gas company sees like a leak in the line and they want to shut it off propane is good propane you store that in tanks you can get that delivered by truck you, um, I have a 500 gallon tank below my backyard and I run that. So that um, that's something you could depend on. The nice thing about propane is propane stores forever. It doesn't go bad. It actually, you know, whereas with gasoline is a liquid, it'll evaporate. It will um, turn into varnish. It might not be good. It'll collect moisture, especially this stupid um, ethanol, <laughs> sorry especially this ethanol um, flavored gasoline they have now that's like 10 percent ethanol that thing absolutely destroys gasoline engines because it attracts moisture it will um and then that moisture will get into the seals and gaskets and cause all sorts of, of havoc it might even rust some things too but let's talk about um the energy story so fuel is actually energy stored and then um, the other common one is batteries. So, <clears throat> yeah, like I said, you can use gasoline generators. That that works well. You can actually use them to also charge batteries, uh, propane or natural gas. And like I mentioned, um, the pros of a of a generator, you know, it's it's cheaper to acquire one. They're longer running. You can always refuel and keep running. They're simpler tech meaning that um, batteries, you don't have to worry about battery balancing and all sorts of things with batteries, but um, they do require some maintenance. They do have emissions. Um, California is going to ban them. Um, I doubt Florida will ban them. I don't think Florida will ban them, to be honest. The EPA and you know might try to ban them, but I don't think um, it's going to happen in Florida. Um, noise, let me sing you the song of your people of my people after midnight no thanks maintenance you need oil changes and it's shocking sometimes you mean you might need an oil change after the initial oil change is like five hours and then 20 hours you would be surprised in a power outage event or even on field day how quickly you would need to change the oil in the generator um some of them go long as 50 hours but you know some of them there are less like I mentioned, propane stores indefinitely, it can be more expensive per gallon. And um, you will require a special carburetor conversion kit, although a lot of dual fuel generators are coming on the market right now, natively dual fuel or natively propane only. And um, like I said, natural gas is always available, but it's not available in all areas, especially if you're rural like me, you're out of luck. Um, the biodiesel, you might need to alter alter the diesel engine a little bit, and it can be difficult to process too. All right, let's talk about solar. <clears throat> so solar panels used to be a curiosity a long time ago, and things have really changed in the market here. Here you're now actually seeing um, a lot of solar panels that are foldable and portable. You go on Amazon, and you will see a lot of... Um, different types of solar panels available portable ones um, and I I really think though that um, you need to be kind of careful because some of them advertise all sorts of specs and you have to be careful so we're going to explain some of that right then of course you have wiring and connectors and we're going to talk about the wiring and connectors too so these portable folding panels they're more expensive they're, but they're portable and lightweight. And this one comes with a case that you could throw this in the back of your of your trunk or your cargo area. And then you go somewhere and you just set that up with your MPPT controller, your solar controller, your batteries, or all-in-one battery power station, and you're good to go. The drawback of these is that often these are, are built with less durable materials around them. So you can't leave these outdoors for permanent outdoor use. You can get these rigid glass panels. They're more, um, you usually get more power out of them. They're usually cheaper. And when I mean cheaper, I mean cheaper per watt 
they're heavier because they have an aluminum frame and they have glass, but you can mount them. You can mount them on your house. You can mount them um, on an RV. You can mount them on a trailer and it's more suitable for outdoor use. And let me explain different types of these panels here. Um, oh, this one is called a bifacial panel. So the bifacial, so usually a solar panel has the, the, um, the silicon surface that'll capture and then they have a back sheet and the back sheet is designed to reflect solar energy and reflect it um, back into the solar cell to generate more electricity. Well, what these bifacial panels do is they omit the back end, they omit the back sheet and um, you actually um, have like if you're on top of a white building or reflective surface or something like that, you actually can put that over that and then reflect sunlight from more angles and you actually get more solar production. So um, that's that's one of the great things about bifacial. Uh, one of the other things too that people don't realize is that they work well over grass and vegetation. And there's a whole new field of solar energy coming up called agrivoltaics. So what they're doing is, because you know solar farms in particular require a lot of um, land space. But what happens is that instead of, um, you know, just clear cutting a whole forest and putting solar panels because that's so green to basically cut down a whole forest to put solar panels. What you can do is you can work with farmers to put these in their existing crop fields. And this has two effects. One of them is that the the plants will reflect green light back. Okay, so that will, you know, that will give some light back to the solar panels. The solar panels will shade some of these plants. So there are some plants, some crops that require partial shade and that will work well. The other effect is that plants will naturally cool down these solar panels. And when these panels are cooler, they generate more electricity because they operate more efficiently. Right. One one thing you you know is that in the heat, solar panels lose their efficiency, and this is manifested in a lower voltage that you see coming out of the solar panels. So um, when it's cooler, it actually produces more, and this is essentially why in the National Electric Code you'll find that um, there's a correction factor for solar panels for places where it gets cold, which again is not Florida, but is up where I am. So you need to size solar arrays that way. All right. So um, when you to optimize solar capture, uh, when you when you shade when you have the panels, of course, shade you know shade is bad, but even partial shade could be a disaster because a lot of these solar cells and solar panels are connected in series. But what happens is that if a one panel is in the array is shaded, it might block some of the power from the other panels. If part of a panel is shaded, because these are panels made up of individual cells, it might block energy from the other cells. Nowadays, though, they put block in diodes. So they basically put bypass diodes to actually bypass the cells that are shaded. That works well um, in commercial, well, not commercial, in residential and um, you know commercially built systems. A company called Solar Edge, what they're doing is they're putting something called optimizers on their panels. So essentially, optimizers now are DC to DC converters, and they attempt to equalize everything in the whole string. So that's some um, uh, partial shading and why you should avoid it. Of course, you face it towards the sun, right? And um, find your angles. So. Finding your angle is interesting because you can look and you can guesstimate, but there are a couple of methods I want to show you that are a little different. All right, um, you could use this active solar tracker. They, I have one of these. It basically detects the sunlight. There are a few companies that make them. EcoFlow used to make one. Uh, there's another company. Um, I think EcoWorthy makes one, and then you essentially put it on. Now, the merits of trackers are debatable. Solar panels are so cheap now, you can actually just buy more solar panels to make up the difference what a tracker would normally make for you. But some people like them because it's cool to see solar panels moving around and tracking the sun. 
Or you could use this little device if you're setting up portable. And this is called a solar angle finder. And I actually have one here with me, which I will show you right here. So this device has a little dot on the surface. And then what happens is, I don't know if, how well you can see this, but it'll cast a shadow. And what happens is when you directly, I'm going to have my little sun here, right? You, you might see this shadow here. And then, um, I don't know how well you can see this. You see this little dot moves with the position. And then you just align it to the center. And then that is the optimal angle of your solar panel, which will capture the most energy. Okay, my son being my cell phone. So this thing is um, many different companies make these now. You can find these all over Amazon. You have a solar angle finder. Another option is you just get like, well, this is not a beer bottle, but pretend this is a beer bottle. You put this on the panel, perpendicular to the panel, and you move the panel around until there is no shadow, uh, meaning that the shadow is flat on the panel. This way you're directly on the sun. And this is a cheap, free way if you're drinking beer anyway, or you're drinking other stuff that's not beer. Um, we don't judge. But, um, you know, that's an easy way to find the angle for your solar panel. And, you know, you could leave it in, in one general direction. Of course, the sun moves throughout the day, or rather the earth moves around the sun, and the earth moves, and um, you'll be able to see... Um, uh, you'll be able to change the angle of the solar panel to capture the most energy. So that's just a tip that I like to show people. If you want to actually do a calculation of your area, you could use, there's a tool called PV Watts, and PV Watts will tell you exactly how much solar energy you can um, generate from your area. So I'm going to show you one here. Uh, let's see here. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is I also broadcast from um, uh, WRMI in Okeechobee, Florida. So I have a radio show on, on WRMI. All right, um, let's see here. So let's see here. Let's do Orlando, Florida, right? You go here. It looks for all the weather data. It gets your latitude and longitude and it drops a pin on the map. You can put a precise home address, by the way. You go to the system information, you know, how much kilowatts you're putting on. Let's say you're doing a four kilowatt system. Four kilowatts will be kind of large. You could put a smaller system if you want to. Um, you have different types of modules, standard, premium, thin film, um, the array type. So this is either you have like an open rack ground mounted, you have it on a tracker, or you have it on your roof. So let's do um, fixed open rack. And you leave these rest of parameters here. You could do advanced parameters, you know, but these are more for installers and solar system designers. So here it waves the wand and it tells you how much power you can expect per year and per month. And you find here that, um, of course, January and February are the worst months for solar, but you find in March and April, May all the way down to, I guess, October, you're sitting pretty on a lot of energy. Let's try my address now because I actually have um, serious, uh, significant changes in seasons, right? So let's see. I go to my location here and you notice I do the same four kilowatt array, but because I have winter, I drop down to this and I have these nice figures here in um, July, August, and in September start to drop off. October drops off even more. November and December, you could pretty much kiss it goodbye because you don't get that many um, uh, hours of daylight, right? So this is a, you know, this is a really interesting tool you could use. You could use it for any size solar array. Let me get ridiculous here. Um, let's say I put a 35 kilowatt solar array on my house. I actually knew I, I was talking to an installer who installed that. Um, yeah, you see, you generate this amount of electricity, ridiculous amount of electricity per year. So it's many ways to to um, 
to slice and dice. So if you want to model a solar system, you can use the PVWatts website, pvwatts.nrel.gov. Alrighty, um, let's see here. All right, cool. All right. Um, <clears throat> Let's talk about the ratings of panels. So you notice like on, on Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist, who still uses Craigslist, but you get um, a lot of these solar panels are being sold. You get used ones, you get some guy say, hey, I have three that fell off a truck, you know, um, but you wanna check out the ratings, right? So the VOC is the open circuit voltage and that essentially tells you the, um, the absolute maximum voltage that a solar panel will produce. The short circuit current is the ex absolute maximum current. The VMP, voltage at maximum power point, and we'll explain what the maximum power point is. And IMP is the current at the maximum power point. And these are under standard test conditions, by the way, which means a, a cool, um, like I think sunny and 70 degrees or something. Right. Um, yeah, 1000 watts per square meter, 25 degrees Celsius. And then um, that's what they have here. <clears throat> when you're wiring these panels, you can wire them in series or parallel. Uh, series will, of course, add voltage and um, is less resistant to shading um, because, like I mentioned, one shaded panel will tend to block the rest. Parallel will add current but is more resistant to shading, right? Because if one is not working well, okay, it's kind of a, not really a big deal. A larger array will actually be a mix of both. So you have some in series and some in parallel. These are kind of connectors you have. They're called the MC4 and they're waterproof. Well, not they're water resistant and they're also UV resistant, good quality ones. And you get this tool to save your fingers. So this tool has like a wrench and also something to squeeze the connectors to. Let's talk a little bit about wind power. Small wind turbines are an interesting thing. A lot of people think that how they'll, <clears throat> excuse me, they'll produce a lot of power easily. Wind turbines I found being, are, are very challenging. They need a lot of height to be effective. And um, they also need um, a charge controller that'll break the turbine. So essentially, the turbine has to actually stop when there's too much wind. You have like an ideal wind band. You know, it can't be too low and it can't be too high. It has to be like Goldilocks zone just right, right? And generally, to be honest, um, you need a battery in a small system to be effective because this thing is constantly ramping up and down. They're not suitable for all areas, which you'll see here. You see like some zones have a lot of wind and some of them don't. You find the central part of the country, you have a lot more wind. And on the coast, you have some um, some areas too. Texas apparently uses a, has a lot of wind power. I mentioned microhydro, if you have flowing water, uh, it's reliable if you have a stream that reliably flows, it's not dependent on sunshine or wind. So let's talk about batteries. <clears throat> and I've been doing a lot of stuff with batteries. Lead acid batteries are old reliable and um, they, they work, but they're heavier and you cannot discharge them as, um, as deep, but anyway. And then lithium types, you have NCM, you have lithium iron phosphate and others. And charge controls, you have PWM which basically switch on and off rapidly and MPPT, the maximum power point tracking. So PWM, um, their pulse width modulation, they essentially, you know, they, are, they switch on and off rapidly. And because of that, they can introduce some noise. Um, they're, they're somewhat crude, but they're a lot cheaper. I mean, you know, but the price of MPPT is coming down. So PWM is, is pretty much going into irrelevancy right now. And here you have like a typical, um, you know, charge curve of a battery here. So you have a bulk charge and then you have an absorption and then you have a float, right? This is for a lead acid battery. 
Lithium kind of um, changes that. You have a constant current phase and then you have a constant voltage phase and you kind of really don't float them. Floating is bad for them. Now, MPPT actually takes advantage of a solar cells, a solar panel's maximum power point. So it will start, <clears throat> excuse me, with no load on a solar cell so, or solar panel. And then it will try out various um, uh, combinations of voltage and current to basically find the maximum power point. And there's a computerized algorithm. Everybody's MPPD controller is similar, yet they're different. And um, they will always ex try to extract the most power. So, but there is actually a company I'm testing, and I'm going to deviate from this script a little bit. DIY Solar for you, I believe is it. Um, their website, okay. Hmm. They um, actually saw them at Dayton and actually bought one of their controllers, right? And um, yeah, the ice, okay. They don't use them letter four, okay. So, um, I bought one of our controllers to test and evaluate, and I'm going to be um, sharing some results of that. So they claim that how they outperform the others because they have, um, they actually show here, they have a buck and a boost, meaning that they could reduce the voltage, but they could also boost the voltage and they actually find the true maximum power point. Um, so I'm gonna try this out and see how this works compared to others. And um, very important um, stuff they talk about here. So, but if you're in the market for a controller, they might be worth a look. And um, the thing about them as well too, is they claim to be very RF quiet. So, and they're made in the US, which is good too, right? So go USA, all right, uh, let's see here. Because all these solar panels and solar charge controls are coming, they're questionable. I mean, none's wrong with China, but you know, a lot of them are coming out of China and they're kind of questionable. Okay. Anyway. All right. So um, EcoFlow actually um, and other companies are making some called solar generators. These are all in one. They have an MPPT controller or one or more MPPT controllers. They have an AC inverter and they have a battery and they have control circuitry. And they have other, they even have a DC um, output. So I have a whole bunch of these and I use these to power my house. So EcoFlow makes them, Jackery makes them. Uh, they're extremely portable um, for various definitions. The word, the EcoFlow one here has wheels. You could put that in the back of your pickup truck or your, or your car. Um, and you can even charge them from an EV charging station but they could charge, you could charge them from your car, you could charge from solar, um, you could charge them from a gas generator. Uh, the 12 volt output um, is sometimes low, so you might need 10 amps maximum, 10 amps maximum might not be suitable for radios. So you might have to power your radios through AC power um, with an external power supply. RFI, um, they're not perfect in terms of RFI, so I've actually used ferrite beads in my installation of them and the newer ones actually come with um, ferrite beads for suppression. Uh, you can do um, home integration. You can wire these into your electric panel and they're getting bigger by the day. Um, they actually sell a, a gas generator too that actually charges these by a DC. So you're not charging via AC and you're saving yourselves a step and you're getting a um, <clears throat> more efficient charge. And the purpose of charging, you could say, well, why don't I run the generator directly? Well, you can do that by day, but nighttime, you want to shut this generator down. But if you have batteries, you can still keep things running. And um, how I integrate this in my house, I use something called a smart home panel. So how it works is that um, it takes 10 circuits and it um, has through this smart transfer switch. And I can have these units here power my house through the panel. You can also program it to 
um, reduce, I don't know if you have time of use rates, but in some places you have time of use rates. You can actually program it to charge from the cheap electricity. And then when the electricity is expensive, you can program it to use. So you can, you can um, program it to, you know, uh, discharge during the off peak hours, during the peak hours, sorry, and then charge during the off peak. And this essentially is a UI. I have individual circuits here. You can see some of my ham gear is on there, Power Genius XL. And I have a whole bunch of statistics that help me. This is the whole ecosystem. You start at 3.6 and you go all the way up to 25 kilowatt hours, right? And this is how they are on RFI. Like I said, they're not perfect, but you know, there is some, um, and I'll illustrate where there is RFI on this graph here. So here I have some here. And this is the MPPT controller um, that I suppressed then got down, but you know, the peak isn't that high really. And you see a lot of stuff on, on an SDR, you normally don't really pay too much attention to in the bands anyway, but you know, it's important to know that it's there. So, you know, if you're going this route, you have to be conscious of that, right? Nothing is perfect, but this is how it is. Um, all right, and I think that was the end of that presentation. Um, thank you for sitting through that. I know it's a lot to digest, but I hope you learned something. All right, and uh, with that, I don't know if you wanna get a few questions or back to net. Hey, Korea, we have um, microphones come around to the room. So if anybody has any questions, raise your hand, we'll bring a microphone to you. I'll step back out of the way of the camera. Referencing portable generators, gasoline versus LP. <clears throat> With gasoline uh, generators, you've got to change oil and all kinds of different things. I know someone here who's sitting in the front row converted his over to LP gas. Is there less maintenance on the LP versions versus the gasoline versions? Good question. So obviously you don't have to replace fuel filters. <clears throat> right that's a major difference um they burn cleaner so the oil probably would not be needed to be changed as often although my philosophy on that is oil is cheap um you know change your oil because if you don't change your oil you have to change your engine um spark plugs run cleaner they burn cleaner so yes you will have a little you could have you could have less maintenance if you wish um but i wouldn't skimp on the maintenance anyway All right, any other questions? Oh, another one. Just one point to note on the generators, the tr they're dual or tri fuel. The propane is less power than the gas, and the LP is less power than the propane. So, good point. So, natural gas actually provides less power. Yes, that is a that is a significant drawback. It provides less power than propane, and propane will provide less power than um, gasoline and gasoline will provide less power than diesel so if you really want to crank up you know power you want diesel but yeah so it's a it's pros and cons right you you want you either want something that stores well and that you know um you can have an indefinite supply of or you want a little bit extra power all right any other questions Oh, James. Hello. Hello. Um, you, you showed us some echo flow boxes that were sitting outside the house. I assume that was to run the house in case it needed emergency power. Are those yours? Um, Is that what you're doing at your house? So mine, so I don't keep mine outside. I keep mine inside actually. Um, okay. I do have photos of mine somewhere. But um, yeah, so I do have, I do, I do, I do use that to power my house. Does that power everything in your house? Except central air. The central air, it does not power the central air. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, just out of curiosity, cost for what you have at your house? <clears throat> right. So, um, 
so the cost so i actually started with them when they were a kickstarter project and some of them were like 2k a unit um so you know but the price generally you you could um for the the really large ones they go for like 3k per unit some of them uh you can find them on sale for cheaper but that's generally the price two to three k per unit the prices are coming down every time and there are lots of options out there there are even um, diy systems with um, server rack batteries which will cost less than that like i saw one for five kilowatts for seventeen hundred dollars so you know there are lots of options okay and you mentioned the uh the two charging methods um the pw house with the PWM, MPPT mm -hmm. was the other one. Is the MPP tail the one that you normally see for the lithium iron type batteries? So MPPT is vastly superior to PWM, right? Um, and I would really recommend if you could get an MPPT controller. So MPPT is maximum power point tracking. If you can get an MPPT controller, I would get that. And if you're getting one standalone, you could try those guys that I just mentioned, the DIY solar for you. But if you want to establish manufacturer, the best ones are Victron and they are, you know, they're top notch. All right, thank you. I have a question. Uh, I've got a portable system, a uh, solar uh, MPPT controller and lead acid batteries. I'm thinking about getting iron phosphate batteries. Will I have to replace my MPPT controller? Um, likely not, because these, uh, to begin with, if you're getting something like a, um, a bio NO power battery, right, they could pretty much charge from MPPT controllers right out the box. Um, and a lot of these lithium iron phosphate batteries could charge from the MPPT controllers. And a lot of the controllers actually, they they might have like a mode you could set where you could change the battery type. So some of them will be set for lead, some of them will be set for lithium. Push the microphone up. Testing one, two. My name is Bob, Five, I'm the one that converted my uh, Honda 2200 generator inverter to propane. I was putting it together in my carport, getting it all installed, and it had a huge storm come up. Didn't even have a chance to try it. I was on the radio with our Skywarn gentleman here in Orlando, and a bolt of lightning took out my transformer behind the house. Ooh. Backup battery for the radio. The storm went down. I put this little Honda up. It ran my refrigerator, a chest freezer, a mini fridge, a light and a fan for 11 straight hours on a barbecue tank of propane. Nice. And quiet, and that was the economy mode too. Every time the the refrigerator cycled, it would pick up a little bit. But the fact, like you said, propane doesn't go bad. It's not the cheapest. But it's it's quiet. If you spill gasoline, look out. You can't spill the propane out of the thing. Right. Exactly. I yeah. got it basically for hand use too, but just you know, and for just in case. So I used it on yeah. the uh, uh, swap feet and meat one time just to put my radios powered up to sell them. But th good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, huge thank you to Rhea for doing our presentation tonight. Um, thank you. Stay cool up there in New Jersey where we are sweltering down here in Orlando, home of Hamcation, but uh, usually in February, it's much, much cooler. So, so next in February. Yeah, I will be there. Um, so yeah, I'll be I'll be there with ARDC next year. So you look out for me. Excellent. You're gonna be in Huntsville also? I am gonna be in Huntsville, yes. We'll see you in Huntsville. We'll be in Huntsville. Great. Excellent. Good to see you also in the Hamvention. All right. Nice. Um, real quick, I just want to go uh, with the room. Did everybody get a prize drawing ticket? Anybody not get a prize drawing ticket? Everybody got them? Okay, while well, Michael is shuffling up the tickets, I want to sit there and um, remind everybody next month's meeting, 
We'll be back in the, uh, the craft building. I've been assured that there's no more events for the rest of this year. That's going to interfere with our meetings. Um, and our guest speakers, Dave Jensen and Steve Benyon, W7DGI and W7DJ, Automatic Attendant Tuner Solutions for the 1KW Operator. So we're gone from QRP to high power. Or as we used to say on another, another band, Florida power. All right. Um, if you are a winner tonight, please come up and see Michael. I need to get your name, your call sign, if you have one, and your email address. Very minimum name and email address. Michael's going to do the drawing. All right. First up is 6877. 6877. Going once. Going twice. Six eight seven seven. Six eight seven seven. I guess not. All right. Somebody left early. Shouldn't have. Six eight six five. Six eight six five. Oh, oh. I heard two eyes. Six eight right. six five. Just go to Michael. He'll get it for right. you. Yeah. Six. Yeah, 6865, right, Michael? Yep. Yep, 6865. Six, All right, next up. 6857. 6857. James? All right. James? And the last one will be 6875. Chrissy. All right, again, a couple of reminders. Um, got a Hurricane Expo coming up on June the 17th at the West Orange High School from 9 o'clock to 1 o'clock, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. You have Red Hot and Boom coming up on um, July the 3rd. You also have the Winter Springs Freedom Fest um, coming up on July the 4th. And on July the 5th is our next meeting, okay? Um, so it's going to be a busy first part of July. I'm hoping everybody can participate. If not, if you can't participate, we understand, but at least have a safe July 4th weekend. Thank you guys. Air conditioning next month. Rhea, thank you again.